It's a real pleasure to be with you. Well, that's a very broad question. Uh, it's hard to know where to start, but uh, as you brought, brought up my mother, maybe I'll start there, um, because she was somebody who was sensitive and, and was sometimes able to know things without you know, sensory input, uh, as it were. So that, in, the, in a way, was my first introduction to the psychic rather than the spiritual. Um, and the, although these things overlap, um, they're by no means the same. Um, but I suppose I, I became interested in in that you know, from a research point of view and reading well, almost when I was about to leave school. And I, I read a, a book by Justin Glass. I can't remember the title now, but it was all about psychic experiences. And, and so I got this sense of contextualizing my mother's experiences, but within the larger literature and field, if you like. And then um, in my last year at university, I discovered Swedenborg. Um, and this was very important um, for me because it was actually via a French poem called Correspondence by Baudelaire. And because I discovered that here was somebody living in the 18th century, such so 1688 to 1772, uh, who was originally a scientist, engineer, an inventor, a neuroscientist who wrote two volumes on the brain, an extraordinary mind, an extraordinary person. And, and in his mid 50s, he suddenly had an opening whereby he was able to see into the invisible dimensions, um, have capacities, clairvoyant capacities, and also speak to people um, in, who, who died um, and have conversations with them, which he then reported in a number of books, including Heaven and Hell and Arcana Celestia. And why this is important in this context of science and spirituality or science and religion um, is that um, here, here was somebody who was really combining, who was a mystic and a scientist together. And the Mystics and Scientists Conferences is something I've been involved in um, for a long time. And so that, that gave me um, an impulse um, and when I started teaching, in fact, the, an important year in my life was uh, 76 to 77, um, when I took four boxes of books abroad and I worked at Champagne, Moet de Chandon, uh, Hennessy, Cognac, and I also studied at Heidelberg University. And, and I read these books, which really gave me the kind of background that I've built on ever since. And that was also related at a slightly earlier stage to meeting a mentor of mine um, called Norman Coburn. And he gave me a large amount of his library, um, which I still have, including the Sacred Books of the East, and the Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics, the complete works of J.G. Fraser, the anthropologist, um, the complete works of Study of History by Toynbee, complete works of Jung, complete works of Steiner, and complete works of Swedenborg, and a few other things besides. And so that gave me a scope, if you like, to to explore these questions more deeply. And I was able to teach a little bit in this area when I was at Winchester College in the early 1980s. And, and but I really had the opportunity of going more deeply into it when I um, was able to start working for the Scientific and Medical Network in 1986, which is nearly 37 years ago. And I've developed my interests since then. I think that'll that'll have to do or will do as a start, because otherwise I'll carry on talking and you won't get any questions in. Inspiring Purpose then is the title of a young person's project that I ran for about 15 years and, and um, which is currently not being being funded and um, but it's, it's a very I, I can t say more about it in a moment and and I this sense of purpose has always been very important to me and, and inspiring purpose in other people and young people in particular I think is crucial so that's in the transforming world views 
And that's more to do with my work with the Scientific and Medical Network and the Galileo Commission and the various other charities, educational charities I've been involved with. Because I think we, we do need a fundamental change of worldview away from mechanistic materialism um, towards something which is both ecological and spiritual and, <clears throat> and integrative and systemic. I mean, all sorts of different words you could use. Um, but the, the worldview that results in the pro challenges that we are facing at the moment um, clearly needs um, to be transformed. I wouldn't say an upgrade because that upgrade would imply that we could have more of the same in the same sense. I think we actually need to change direction and change our priorities and fundamental values. And then living our truth, and that's always been important to me because I, um, when I was at university, I studied existentialism. And, and in existentialism, you have this notion of authenticity, of being true to yourself. And in about 1975, I read a very important book called Testimony of Light by Helen Greaves. And in that, it talks about a blueprint, the idea that we come in with a blueprint of a, a sort of soul purpose, if you like. And our job is to keep close to that blueprint, you know, to try and remember as much of pos as possible of it, um, because the fall in Gnostic philosophy, for instance, is sometimes a fall into separation and a fall into forgetfulness and a fall into spiritual sleep, if you like. And, and so I've always tried to keep myself what I call on track um, so far as this blueprint, this evolution, this soul purpose um, and living my truth is concerned. And it's, it's also important in terms of integrity um, <clears throat> because I've, I've had to make certain sacrifices um, you know, in a more worldly sense you know, in order to maintain that sense of integrity um, and not betray, uh, as I would see it, you know, fundamental spiritual principles. Because, and this particularly is connected with my work with Bulgarian sage Peter Dunov. Uh, because that that um, I, I had to take a stand and and um, really s uh, you know say that this is this is what I believed in this is what I was going to you know devote myself to so so I think that's probably hopefully reasonable explanation of those three you know key theme phrases in my life. <laughs> It, the idea came initially from a project for Sir John Templeton uh, called Laws of Life. And, and what he felt, and he was a great you know, financier and philanthropist, he felt that um, young people needed to formulate for themselves and understand some fundamental laws of life. And so he had an essay contest whereby he could, you know, young people rather, could uh, write about what they had discovered as an important law of life. And then he had prizes um, and award ceremonies around the, the essays that were submitted. So I tried this idea out, but I wasn't very successful because really young people don't read, need an extra essay to write. And, and so I had the idea of metamorphosing the whole notion into uh, a template. And, and the template was originally a huge A zero poster absolutely enormous um, and it folded up but it had different sections on it and then we transformed it into a three-page uh, template where the first page is about values and qualities and virtues and so um, there are different ways of carving it up as it were depending on whether i was doing the olympics or the commonwealth games or world war one um, but the, the principle was that there were four boxes with different values and qualities themed um, into the four streams, if you like. And then what young people had to do or have to do is they have to identify which of those um, they are really good at and which they really need to work on. Originally, we just had them ranking them in sort of order and then writing something about the one they thought was most important. 
And just just as an aside, um, the most important um, qualities or features for young people are friendship and trust. And we found this repeatedly um, every year. And so that's the values part. And, and then depending on the exact template, we might have um, a favorite poem um, or a favorite image um, with World War I or World, the, the poem and the image together. And then page two is inspiration. Um, and who are you inspired by? Why do they inspire you? And, and another section for quotes by that person or inspiring quotes. And so that's page two. Page three is aspiration. So at one point it was called inspire hyphen aspire. And so it's converting inspiration into aspiration. And, and so that, that typically we'd ask them to um, answer specific questions. What do you want to um, achieve and contribute in your life? Not just achieve, but also contribute. And because as Churchill said, we make a living by what we get and we make a life by what we give. And so giving back is incredibly important and also for a sense of satisfaction and happiness and contentment. And then depending on the poster, the template, we might ask them um, you know, how they define their goals or how they're going to contribute to peace. And we always have a, a question which puts the student on the spot. In other words, what are you personally going to do about this? Not what are, what are other people, what are they going to do, but what are you going to do? How are you going to contribute? Because if we want a different kind of world, then we need different kinds of people, different priorities, different values, and we need to co-create it together um, with a, a really coherent vision. So, and, and then on the back, we have teacher feedback, peer feedback, and then they can give us suggestions about how to improve the project. And in each case, we had a website with a teacher's section and a um, student section and um, saying wh where they could find examples and really holding them by the hand. And then we'd have a cycle of awards. And so in the summer, uh, we'd ask the, the schools to send back their best <coughs> half dozen posters in, in different year, year groups. Uh, and then we would have school awards and national awards uh, given by prominent people. And we'd also have prominent people judging um, the national side of things. So, so that's how it worked. Um, and we had uniformly you know, positive feedback from the students. Um, if they really engage, then they understand that they, they are what happens to life. Life is not something that just happens to them they can happen to life. Well, the Scientific and Medical Network is just celebrating 50 years this year. It was founded in 1973 um, by some senior academics and civil servants. Um, and the reason it was founded was that they felt that young people in particular were um, being indoctrinated into what we now call scientism or scientific materialism. And in other words, that everything has a material basis, that matter gives rise to mind and consciousness, matter is primary, and, and everything can be understood mechanistically. And, and they, they've, they didn't feel this was um, an adequate worldview, uh, also in terms of meaning and values. And I should emphasize that they all had mystical experiences. And so they all understood that there was more to life than meets the eye physically. And, and so they knew in themselves that there was the, there was the, the world, were these other dimensions, which is why meditation has been an important component in the network. And it started in, on a small scale and, and it grew very rapidly until about 2000 and then it declined a bit and now it's growing rapidly again and there for various um, internal reasons. And well, what we do is we really operate at the interface between a number of different sciences, science and. So we've got science and spirituality, science and consciousness, science and mysticism and science and esotericism. And you notice I didn't say 
science and religion and or science and theology because we're not really in the science and religion field there is a science and religion forum in uh, the uk and um, which is a kind of sister organization um, and we're not specifically interested in christian theology also some of our members are so we're a bit more philosophical if you like and so we have a program um, our two flagship conferences are the Mystics and Scientists Conference, which next year will be number 46. So it's been going since 1978. And then the Beyond the Brain Conference, which this year will be, I think, number 17. Uh, we're now running this every year, and whereas we were running it every other year. <clears throat> and it started in Cambridge with the Institute of Neurotic Sciences in 1995. So that's been going for some time. And then we've just had our annual meeting and, and we've been looking back at, you know, visions of interconnectedness in science and spiritual wisdom. And, and we, we have we had a number of our honorary members um, speaking to that, including Rupert Sheldrake, uh, Keith Ward, the theologian, um, Vandana Shiva, uh, Marjorie Woolacott, Ravi Ravindra, and, and then Ian McGilchrist and Federico Fagin. And so these are all people who are well-known and prominent um, in their fields and we, we so we have a, a number of honorary members including sir roger penrose and so as to other activities i've been editing the journal for um you no know, hundred and something issues you know, so, so since 1986 so that is a member's journal it comes out three times a year and then we also have weekly webinars and we have dialogues twice a week and um, once a sort of more formal dialogue uh, on a Monday then we have our regular webinars on a Wednesday and on a Friday we have what we call a virtual bar and um, so this is more informal and people can come and talk more informally about their experiences uh, about their views and so we ask somebody to introduce a topic you know for 20 minutes or so and then it's it's open for discussion and I should also emphasize that the network provides what we call a safe space uh, where people can have significant conversations about important topics of life um, without feeling that they're going to be disqualified or sacked from their department or anything like that and one of our more recent initiatives is a book called spiritual awakenings where we've got 57 academics and scientists talking about their transformative experiences and <clears throat> processes and now i'll just say something about the galileo commission and um, this is a project of the scientific medical network um, it's been going a number of years we produced in 2018 a report by professor harold valach and um, on called beyond a materialist worldview and um, try and expand science especially the science of consciousness beyond these materialistic assumptions because the important point to note is that materialism is in fact a philosophy, it's not science. And that any field has assumptions and presuppositions behind it. And one of these assumptions, which we call into question, is that the mind is produced by the brain. That the brain produces <clears throat> or generates consciousness. And we think, along with William James and others, that there's good evidence for this not being an adequate theory uh, and this has been criticized um, brilliantly and thoroughly in, in the recent book the matter with things by ian mcgilchrist so that gives you some idea of that work we do um, monthly webinars free webinars the galileo commission anybody can join up as a friend or if you're an academic a scientist you could join up as a professional affiliate we've got about 500 of these and um, and um we also do i also do one other thing which is uh, book briefings so these are book review briefings and um, where i speak to authors about their work and we have a podcast called imaginal inspirations where i speak to people about the influences in terms of their lives and their influences in terms of books and um, people <laughs> Well, I suppose, I mean, my first book 
I wrote it in 1982, and, and it was called Survival. I wrote it, in fact, over the summer holidays of, you know, from when I was teaching. I'm not quite sure how I managed that, but I did. And um, what I was concerned with was um, what happens at death. And is our consciousness, our mind, are they just extinguished with, with no trace? Or is death a kind of transition into another state of being, another state of consciousness? So that, that, that was a book that, that um, looks at the history of the mind-body problem uh, or issue and how people see the relationship between the brain <clears throat> and the mind, the brain and consciousness. And then I had a chapter on evidence. Um, which is what counts as evidence, what kind of evidence should we be looking at when we're looking at, um, at this field. One, another one on Swedenborg, and then on apparitions, out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, which is quite a young field at that point, and <clears throat> post-mortem survival, in other words, descriptions of what it's like to die. And you might think to yourself, well, how can that happen? Well, it does. Um, and the the descriptions are consistent um, across cultures. So what's, and, and then I had a uh, conclusion. So that was my first book. And then my second book was really on the ethical side or the ethical implications of this, because I was looking at particularly the near-death experience <clears throat> and post-mortem life review, where people, you see your life in a flash, and then you experience not only what it was like to be yourself in that situation but also to be how other people were affected by you in that situation so it's as if you experience the event multi-dimensionally in other words from the point of view of, of everybody who experienced it directly or indirectly and this then gives you an interconnected vision a field vision if you like of the nature of reality um, where we share in some sense the same universal consciousness um, which i think is fundamentally the divine and and that means that we can affect each other because we're microcosms of the same life the same consciousness and um, and so what we do to each other in inverted commas is actually what we're doing to ourselves and i i feel that if people really understood this and um, then um, the world would be a different place uh, and especially at the moment with the amount of violence um, and war going on and um, <clears throat> uh, it's it's unthinkable you know from this point of view so those are my two first books and the more recent ones that have just been re-edited just to mention those um <clears throat> are um uh, thinking beyond the brain and a new renaissance and then a couple of years ago, I published um, a series of essays. I had a chance to, to publish in one about 25 essays, which I called A Quest for Wisdom, because that really sums up my life. And um, then last year, I, I, I put, put, put together a, a volume of poetry um, called Better Light a Candle, Better Light a Candle Than Curse the Darkness. And the great thing about poetry is you can say in a page, what it might take several pages of prose to express. The book came out originally in 2010, <clears throat> and up until that point, and even since, we've we've held a number of conferences, you know, with the title something like "Towards a New Renaissance." Um, because if you go back to earlier renaissances, particularly the Florentine Renaissance, it was a renaissance of wisdom. Um, suddenly <clears throat> there was access to you know, previously <clears throat> unpublished or other untranslated works, particularly of Plato and Platonism. And, and that gave a new impetus to um, the, the spiritual and indeed also intellectual development of, of Western Europe. And we're talking obviously about Western Europe here, particularly rather than <clears throat> other parts of the world. Um, and so this is one one model, if you like, literally meaning rebirth, one model of of renewal. Um, and so that's the reason why we um, 
used that title. Um, it's a different way of saying, if you like, transforming worldviews, and um, which, which, or, or you know, um, transforming paradigms, if you were to use a more scientific or philosophy of science term. Um, so the rebirth um, it, it implies going back to the roots. I think it, it's prophetic, and um, it means going back to these fundamental values. You know, particularly the Platonic Trinity of the good, the beautiful, and the true, and which, which you know is a good um, basis for um, any um, all the principles of Peter Dunoff: love, wisdom, truth, justice, and goodness. And again, these are very, very fundamental. And so, what I where I think we are at the moment um, globally um, is that um, there are there is a there is a planetization or globalization or globalizing going on, um, but it's really aimed at um, what Lewis Mumford would call mechanical uniformity. And this is in other words, it's a mechanistic concept, and it's being aided and abetted by technology and technocracy, um, with increased uh, capacity for surveillance and control and manipulation. Um, and narrative control in particular and propaganda. Um, the, the, the 1930s, which, where you see a lot of this, and in fact, the beginning of the advertising industry as well, um, there's not, that they had very little um, by way of propaganda capacity compared with what we've got now. Whereas what I see, and this is sort of bifurcation of evolution, if you like, what I see is that we need um, a regenerative healing culture which respects individuals um, which um, is unity and diversity as opposed to mechanical uniformity and if I were to put this in the Ian McGilchrist right hemisphere left hemisphere language then his critique would be to say that uh, technocracy which is scientific engineering of society notice the engineering metaphor there um, uh, is a left hemisphere activity all about control and manipulation because this is and the forte and, and regulation as well. We're absolutely steeped in regulations and procedures. Whereas the, if you integrate the left and the right, and then the right hemisphere um, gives you intuition, it gives you imagination, it gives you apprehension of novelty. And, and he's not saying that we should, we should prioritize the right against the left. He's saying we just got to get them in balance. And if you get them in balance, in harmony, and then you have the kind of society with, with, which corresponds to nature, because nature is unity and diversity. It's harmony and diversity. Um, it's, it's, there is competition, <clears throat> but there's also cooperation. Uh, and so this is, this is a much more localized and, and non-militarized vision. You can see that's what some people call globalization as opposed to globalization. And you can see this moving in the opposite direction of subsidiarity um, of uh, delegating capacity to local initiatives, encouraging grassroots and, and um, encouraging local agriculture rather than global food systems, which are becoming more and more artificial. <clears throat> um, but all the money at the moment is on the technocratic industrial side. Um, and this is why we urgently need more people to understand exactly what's going on, why it's going on, um, and to come up with an alternative vision um, where we can really be human, develop our humanity, rather than becoming you know, inhuman by combining m machines and or merging humans with machines, um, which is part of what's called the fourth industrial revolution. And all of this is being driven by a number of agencies, but in particular, the World Economic Forum, um, which is an incredibly influential um, business network um, that works with and within governments to try and promote its agenda, which is also expressed in the UN um, 2030 um, Sustainable Development Goals. And so one needs quite a lot of perspicacity to understand what's going on um, between the text, if you like, because the words are one thing, but the reality of what the words mean is another.
Well, I think I think well, the first thing to say is that um, we need to avoid dogmatism on both sides, and that the, the the dogmatism of traditional religion and the dogmatism of science, particularly as materialistic view, um, they reflect each other, and they each have the idea um, that if you're not orthodox, you're heretical, and if you're heretical, you have to be suppressed or repressed or censored or deplatformed or removed. Uh, and we've seen this very strongly in operation, you know, <clears throat> in, in relation to the recent pandemic. Um, the information control been, has been absolutely unprecedented. And so I think really uh, that one of the important things, which is also a value of the network, is, is balancing openness and rigor, uh, critical rigor, because um, if you're open without any critical analysis, then you can be taken in. Um, but if you are uh, over critical, um, then you won't be sufficiently open to new perspectives. And so this, this, this is, a, um, I think, a transformative um, uh, impulse. But what I've also learned, um, and particularly through our volume, um, Spiritual Awakenings, um, is that for scientists at any rate, it's always a question of a crucial experience as opposed to a crucial experiment. <clears throat> because people who demand crucial experiments, when somebody presents them with a crucial experiment which might change their view, they generally demand another one and another one. And, and so worldviews are changed through transformative experiences where people themselves encounter what we call the deeper structures of reality. And I, I, and I think, um, you know, if I take, you know, my friend Rupert Sheldrake um, uh, as an example of a, a pioneering spiritual scientist, um, and he's, he's somebody who's got an extraordinary brilliant mind and sense of humor. And, and, and he's, he's been pinned as a heretic. Um, and yet he still persists with the scientific method, with setting up experiments, reporting his results, and making them available so people can replicate his experiments. And he's maintained a kind of fortitude and moral courage in adversity because he's been attacked. And also, his, as you may know, his TED talk was taken down, <clears throat> the ironic result of which was um, that it got five million views and it hadn't got you know, even more than a few hundred thousand before. Um, and so I, I admire that that integrity and, and moral courage. And I think moral courage is hugely important in life generally. Well, I've, I've learned a lot um, about this from a number of people. Um, including Piterim Sorokin and Peter Dunov. So I just focus on, <clears throat> on them. Um, Sorokin was the, the first professor of sociology um, at Harvard in the 1930s. Um, and he was, had had a lot, big research project in the 1950s, which was published as The Ways and Power of Love in 1954. It's republished by the Templeton Foundation in, in 2004. And, and he, he recognized that there these different levels of love, different types of love, in a very similar way to Peter Dunoff, um, who, who, whose higher understanding of love, he called love as a force in the mind and love as a principle in the spirit. And by love as a force in the mind, he meant that people who embodied love and served love, and you no know, Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Jane Goodall, <clears throat> you can think of your own um, examples. And then love as a principle in the spirit is a love that resolves contradictions, that resolves polarities. Uh, and we, we live in um, a system which is predominantly driven by power, greed, and manipulation and fear. So we um, we need a reversal of this polarity, almost like a kind of pole shift, if you like. And we need to take love more seriously, with a capital L. And what um, 
Gandhi said, he said, love is a cosmological force. Um, and he demonstrated this. And so I think we need to work together to elaborate and practice um, a profound revolutionary philosophy of love. After all, what was Jesus's message about? What is the message of the great sages? The message of the great sages is always love and compassion, love and wisdom. You know, understand cosmic laws, act according to cosmic laws. Um, and the sages are the people who've been there, and they are you know, the greatest human beings um, who've ever existed on the planet. Um, so we should be listening to what they uh, have to say. And, and so that would be an alliance for me. And there are very many people in groups, like including your own, working around the world uh, to try and bring this forward. Um, but I think we need as a society to take this much more seriously and realize how much we already do out of love. How, some of our institutions, the Red Cross, um, you know, other charities, um, they're all set up um, because of a motivation of love. And so Peter Dunoff said that we're moving towards a culture of love, um, which eventually will triumph because the, the regressive negative forces are ultimately self-defeating. Um, but then we need to stand as beacons of light, as beacons of love individually and as groups um, so that people can see um, that this is the fundamental spiritual reality and value. And Dunoff himself said that when we go to the other world and we have our life review, he said, you will be examined on how you have applied the law of love. And that's quite a thought. Um, and one that, you know, I, I'll be challenged with um, myself, but I think it's up to us to try and uh, live as consciously as we can in service of the greater whole.